Hi, welcome back. I'm Joel Getz, and I work here at the School of Management. Uh, and I'd just, I'm introducing the panel and introducing Margaret Warner, who will be introducing the panelists. Um, in a crowd like this, I don't think Margaret really needs an introduction. Um, but regardless, I'll say a few words. <laughs> Margaret, senior correspondent and on-air anchor of public television's PBS NewsHour. She's also the chief correspondent for the NewsHour's overseas reporting unit, reporting from hot spots around the world. You name the place and she's been there. Margaret's a 1971 Yale graduate with great service to the university, including serving on the Yale Corporation. I'd also now like to mention another very special Yale graduate. Have you seen in the program this session and the speakers were supported by the R. Peter Strauss Class of 44 Distinguished Visitors Program. It's a fund at the Yale School of Management established by Mr. Strauss's children in his honor and now memory since he died last year. The purpose, uh, now 2012, so just over a year. The purpose of the fund is to bring respected individuals to speak on general topics that relate to the press and public responsibility. Let me say a few words about Mr. Strauss. I didn't know him, and to be honest, until doing some research uh, in the past few, few days, I didn't know about him, very much about him. Um, and I regret now learning about him that I never met him. I encourage all of you to Google, or as my friends at Microsoft would say, to Bing him and learn about him. He graduated from Yale in 1943, and in the late 1950s took over WMCA and turned it into one of the nation's most integrative, innovative radio stations, broadcasting what are regarded as the first radio editorials, political endorsements, including that of President Kennedy, and helped popularize rock and roll, including the Beatles. There was just one quote, because it's quite fitting um, that, that this supports Margaret's uh, panel, it said his most memorable contributions were in radio. Long before NPR created a network for high quality news, music and discussion programs, WMCA pioneered public service radio in New York and then talked about the civic issues that it covered. So I think it is quite fitting. He came from a family steeped in public service, relatives in public service and himself where he was President Johnson's assistant administrator for aid to Africa and director of the Voice of America. And finally, since Ted, Dean Snyder, mentioned at the his opening comments yesterday that this was being broadcast and simulcast around the world to our alumni and to global network schools, I thought I would check. Uh, obviously, there, there are far more people watching out there than are, than are here in this room, but I checked to see how many countries were people had tuned in from. And as of yesterday, it was 21 distinct countries. Without further ado, Margaret. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joel, and, and thank you all for being here. We've had already an incredibly stimulating 24 hours talking about the uh, world that is facing the business leaders and managers of both today and, and the future. And some of the factors that, that really are adding to the complexity of it. I mean, everything from trends in the global financial system to the new challenges of, of managing and encouraging uh, creativity, uh, the changing nature of markets and consumers. And so I, for this last session of today, we thought it appropriate now to put on the hot seat and explain to us uh, from the, the men and women who actually have taken on the task of training students of today to be these global leaders in, in an increasingly uh, complex world. They are nine deans and directors of nine of the 25 schools in the uh, Network for Advanced Global Management or the Global Network of Advanced Management. And this is the first, I didn't realize this, Ted, until you said it yesterday, the first such network of global business schools that have undertaken this mission to try to take business and management education to this, to this next uh, international level. And um, so without further ado, I'm gonna briefly, you have longer bios of everyone in your programs, but I'm just gonna go from my right around. Ted, first of course, Ted Snyder, whom you all know, Yale SOM here in New Haven and very much the catalyst behind this global network and, 
and today's uh, event. Uh, Miriam Erez from, uh, from Haifa, Israel, uh, from the uh, Technion In Israel Institute, excuse me, of Technology, and she's Vice Dean of the NBA program there. Then Professor Michael Barzilay, who's Professor of Public Management and also Head of the Department of Management at the London School of Economics. Uh, Kwame Domfe, who is Dean of the University of Ghana Business School. Uh, Maria de Lourdes Pieck, uh, of a Garde Business School at Monterey Tech. On my left, Nita Bektash, who is the new executive, fairly new executive director of the Koch Business School in, uh, in Istanbul. And Dvanet, Devanet Tirupati, forgive me for uh, mangling your name, uh, Dean of the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. Jerry Mao, Dean of the Renmin University in Beijing, of course, and Santiago Iniguez, Dean of the IE Business School in Spain. So uh, without more ado, I'm just gonna jump right into it. And uh, Santiago, I think I'll start with you. How do you, how different is the mission of your school today than it would have been even 15 years ago? Well, it has become very different because management changes uh, more rapidly than many other subjects. But allow me to use uh, a way that Financial Times uh, used for describing our business school, no? which is probably much better than any mission statement that I can provide you with. Uh, Financial Times used to say that uh, IE is an unusual school with unusual people. I guess uh, the first moment, you know, I wasn't sure whether this was a piece of criticism or actually a, a positive comment. But thinking it twice, uh, I guess that our school is very different in terms of uh, the students, the faculty. It's very unusual. No? And we're actually confronting many different challenges, if I might, may just mention two of them. First, uh, management uh, has to be transformed and reinvented. We need to reinvent capitalism, so we have the, the great challenge in front of us of how to reinvent all the financial institutions and, and management institutions. And second, how to develop the best uh, possible managers, maybe focusing on different forms of intelligence, not just the traditional ones, uh, analytical skills, but many other forms of uh, intelligence, emotional, spatial, uh, 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 creative, artistic, that probably have to do more with success in real life in management than the traditional skills. So uh, the challenges are big, and I guess that uh, we are in the process of uh, facing them. And Jerry, oh, well let me just ask, what percentage of foreign students do you have? Well, in our MBA program, it's close to 95% of international <laughs> students, so it's, it's very unusual in this way. Uh, and actually, you know, this international environment is part of the learning process. No? And Jerry, what about you at, at, uh, at Renmin? To what degree is, is your mission different in this globalized world now than it might have been 15 years ago. Of course, China's economy is changing so fast and you're, so much is changing fast there. That's but. right. Uh, compared to 10 years ago, I think I can say two things. One, we have to help our students to adapt to the pace of change. And secondly, uh, there's a strong need to, to be more international. And uh, we're, uh, you know, comparison with the IE School of Business, but uh, we are gradually adding the number of uh, international exchange partners and being part of this uh, global network has been uh, uh, tremendously helpful to our students. And we're in terms of helping our students to adapt, uh, we have adopted a uh, uh, number of new modes of learning, emphasizing more on the reflective learning and uh, experiential learning and team actions in our program, in our EMB program, for example, um, uh, every day when they have class, they spend the first half an hour reflecting together as a group in our EMB program. In our MBA program, we're emphasizing we have launched a uh, team action project, students working on real world mm -hmm. projects under the supervision of professors who conducting consulting projects. So these are the two mm -hmm. highlights in terms of differences between ten, uh, now and 10 years ago. Let me hear from you at I, I, IAM now. Uh, there were supposed to be slides that uh, would have your school, but uh, either my battery's dead or something. But anyway, IAM in Bangalore. We are in, can you hear I me? think it'll pick yeah. up. Sure. Uh, we are in some ways uh, exact opposite of what Santiago mentioned. 
our student body is uh, mostly Indian, almost 99%. Uh, <coughs> but we have also gone through tremendous change in the last 20 years. The world has completely transformed. And we have uh, several challenges. One of them is, of course, globalization. And associated with that, we have to uh, enable our students to develop many skills. Uh, but I'll probably mention the other one, which is becoming equally uh, or even in some ways more important, is the growth of last 20 years has created too much <coughs> of contra uh, contradictions in our economy. Even in a city like Bangalore, for example, you would find pockets of affluence, which are like any other developed world. And then within 100 yards, you would find um, people who don't have enough to eat, even a single meal a day, and so on. And this has created a lot of uh, tensions and problems. And one of the things we believe is the leaders of tomorrow should operate in this environment. And they should understand this context to operate effectively. And what percentage of your students would you say foresee uh, a career in, if not international business, businesses that must operate in a global context? Oh, a large number. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, even the Indian companies, I think they all have global aspirations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they are looking at that. And today, of course, uh, many of the multinational companies have set up offices and they have uh, uh, operations in India. And also we are witnessing uh, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, many of the global companies with offices in New mm -hmm. York, London, Hong Kong, uh, coming to our campuses mm -hmm. and recruiting our graduates. So. Anita, what about you at Kutch? Uh, I mean, being an emerging and developing market, uh, I would say uh, one of the b major uh, challenges that we have is the uncertainty. Because uh, with the fast growing organizations and the with the economy changing very rapidly, our uh, mission is to prepare our students uh, to decide on their uncertain situation and uh, make their decisions uh, based on data, which may come in very unstructured ways, mm -hmm. and uh, they have to uh, be able to analyze and uh, decide on their uh, uncertain situation. Obviously, globalization and internationalization is uh, among the uh, very known uh, challenges. And uh, also for Turkey, I it is the aspiration of our students to work in multinationals and uh, be prepared under uh, competitive situations, be prepared uh, uh, for uh, cross-cultural relations and uh, mm -hmm. have all those uh, aspirations with them. And Lorda, what about at Monterey Tech? At Monterey Tech, uh, our mission is to develop leaders that have an entrepreneurial spirit. This part mm. of the entrepreneurial spirit is really part of the DNA of uh, our Monterey Tech for a long time. However, this time we want uh, to further uh, deepen into this idea of the entrepreneurial spirit, but also with another component, which we call the human outlook. And when we say the human outlook, we're talking about several components, ethics, the social responsibility of the companies, and something else, the citizen responsibility of our, our sphere. So we want these leaders, very important, to be competitive internationally, have this global vision, but you cannot have an entrepreneurial spirit without being global. You cannot, you know, this human outlook has to do also with all these problems that uh, the world and, and therefore the companies have also to be in a way responsible to dealing with them. And I think that we need these responsible citizens, um, leaders that we are graduating, that have the best credential, the, ex the excellence in academic education, but also have these skills and these attitudes and values mm -hmm. that we need today. Thank you, and Kwame Donfe, how about at University of Ghana? And, and give us a sense of your student body. Uh, how much are Ghana, from Ghana, how, how many are African? and, and how has your mission changed? Thank you, thank, you, thank you very much. For the University of Ghana Business School, the population is quite big. Um, we have a student population of about 3,000. 49% uh, of that doing undergraduate programs and 51% being graduate students. 
um, the agenda focus of the, of the school has changed a little. Um, if I were to take you back, it was established right after independence. And the agenda was to make sure that we produce middle level personnel <laughs> who would service the public sector. That was the reason why it was set up in the 1960s. But if we look at the situation now, the public sector is no more able to absorb many of these graduates. And therefore, we need to change our agenda and then our focus and our objectives and make sure that we can train people who will fit not only into the public service, but also mm -hmm. into the private sector, non-governmental entities, and the third sector. Um, we are also very much interested in what is being done in Mexico, training people to be very entrepreneurial. Uh, because uh, once we give them those skills, they will be able not only uh, to create jobs, but they can create jobs and then employ others who go get along and then work with them. So that is the focus of what the University of Ghana Business School mm -hmm. is attempting to do. And, and Michael Barjolet, now certainly um, LSE is the classic global business school. But first of all, what does that term really mean? And, and, and how has it changed, say, in the last just 15 years now? Well, I, I mean, LSE is not a business school in and of in itself. It's a, yeah. Well, the whole university, it's a social science yes. university. Yes. And actually, uh, it's been committed as an institution to understanding the causes of things, uh, all things social, if you wish, on kind of the individual level mm -hmm. up to the world economy level. And there's been a commitment since its inception to social betterment. Uh, it was founded by Fabian socialists. Uh, um, for the most part, the concerns of betterment have been applied to public policy, and it's only in the last 15 years that LSE has become particularly interested in applying that same ethos uh, to management, whether public or private. Um, so I think what's kind of interesting about LSE is that we joined the uh, quest for management education, good management education, late in the game. I think the students come. Uh, they come from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend not to come from the uh, British Islands. Uh, and they're looking for um, uh, a first-hand encounter uh, with uh, uh, the educational culture that has been that has developed alongside um, uh, the world economy. And I think they're looking for um, first-hand educational experience with the kind of actual culture that you see in a place like uh, Yale. And I think it's not actually that much different in its orientation. Mm -hmm. And Miriam Erez at, at uh a Technion. Uh, okay, the Technion is an, institu an institute of technology, so it's very different from what you just said. And uh, most of our students are, are engineers in their background, and when they come to get their MBA, they are interested in, uh, they, they see themselves as leaders of, of um, multinational, high tech multinational companies. So, and Israel is a world leader. Yeah. So our focus is on, uh, on technology, innovation, and globalization, because this is the how, we, how we envision the future of uh, companies in that they are going to lead in the future. And Ted, uh, to speak to us, you have already, but to about the globalization focus that you particularly brought here, but when it sort of really took off at Yale and how it's changed the mission of SOM, other than being in this gorgeous new building. So, um, yeah, you've heard a lot about our mission. Our, our, our mission is to educate leaders for business and society. I think what, what we're confronting now is the opportunity to, to modernize and globalize that mission. And so much has changed. I think it's sort of interesting to me to think what has not changed in management education over the last 10 or 20 years. And, and I'd say uh, two things. We still teach how markets work. I, th I still believe in supply and demand. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I had a teacher who said, every problem you should start with supply and demand. And students still need to understand how markets work. Uh, and we still teach organizations and leadership and networks and teams. But after that, everything's different. And I, I, I basically would just underscore all of what my colleagues here have said and then just broaden it very briefly. The, those, those two basic competencies that I talked about, understanding markets, understanding organizations, that's what's driven 
management education around the world. There's some 13,000 business schools in the world. There are 25 business schools now in this global network. We've got nine of us here, but there are actually many deans and directors also in the audience. But th this is a big success story, but th it's, it's really interesting how each of our schools is adapting. And, but I think one great commonality is, Margaret, as you said, globalization. The top business schools in the world are globalizing. Even, even a, I am Bangalore, where most of the students are from India, most of those students have global aspirations. And that raises the question, of course, what sort of world you all are preparing your students for. I mean, if you think about since the end of the Cold War, there was this sense that we were the world, there were more and more market economies, and kind of, I don't know, maybe it was an implicit assumption that there, the world was slowly converging on a kind of US European model of how market economy works. But I'm wondering whether you all think, Santiago, why don't you start, that's still true today, or are you having to teach, are different models developing in different regions of the world and you're having to help train your students to understand those? I'm particularly thinking of the relationship between government and business. Absolutely, uh, I mean, there's lots of convergence, as you say, and the way we teach, for example, how to evaluate companies is very much similar across the board. I guess we use the same manuals, the, the same, but then you have to adapt whenever you calculate parts of those equations. You have to uh, take into account the particularities of each uh, domestic market. You need to deal uh, down to uh, the very domestic issues, the native things. So that's why management is still very much attached to the local environment. Even if we need to uh, uh, nurture cross-cultural global citizens, uh, global managers, we still need to also instill in those managers respect for different uh, cultures, uh, different visions of the world, uh, different visions even of the good life. And I guess that uh, many of the schools we presented here, all of the schools we presented here, do actually practice uh, these sorts of uh, uh, education and learning process. I guess we have to go back to uh, the concept of, of virtues which is very much embedded in uh, education. The concept of? Uh, virtues, I mean, managerial virtues, and one of those virtues can actually be, uh, you know, how to behave mm. uh, ethically in a, a global environment, no? So this is part of uh, the learnings across all the schools we presented here, and in fact, some of the seminars that are now delivered by uh, the same uh, network are actually dealing with these uh, cross-cultural challenges, no? And, and what about learning to deal in, say, an economy like China? I'm going to turn to somebody else who's, n who's not in China to, to explain. I mean, that is a very, very different system. And all these companies want to do business in China, but it is not a Western model. Want to weigh, weigh in here, Nita? Uh, How do you train your students to, to understand? I, I read something the other day about a really good, a, a business or management student now has to also see through the lens of a political scientist and understand d how to analyze different economies, the relationship between business and government or other sectors and government. Uh, I think uh, with the complexity uh, of the world we are living in and with the, uh, with the uh, necessity of uh, learning things by doing, uh, we have uh, put business embeddedness in our programs. And basically, uh, specifically that you're asking China, we have a course uh, called Doing Business in China, and we do that course uh, in China. So yeah. our students uh, have uh, study uh, China before going there, but they spend uh, literally one week in China where they visit uh, businesses uh, who are doing only business in China as well as uh, who are uh, doing multinationally businesses. Uh, and uh, it definitely helps uh, going there, seeing things and uh, seeing government relations. That's a very specific uh, issue. And uh, we try to take that uh, in mind and uh, especially uh, doing 
things, experiencing things, helps uh, learning uh, and uh, the global network and having that uh, relation, multilateral relations mm -hmm. with uh, networks mm -hmm. like GNAM uh, helps uh, stimulating those relations. So yes, please. Yes, I think we, we cannot pretend about the, um, the influence of China in the global po po political system. The, at the University of Ghana Business School, and I think you've been within the whole university, we, we learn not only about Chinese business, that's also Chinese language, yeah, but at the business school level 100, Chinese, Spanish, these are two languages that are core for the level 100 students to learn. So as well as English, they should learn Chinese and Spanish. E exactly, exactly. English is the medium of instruction, but Chinese and then Spanish are um, languages that we learn at the level 100 because the world is moving in such a way that I think we will need these languages in order to be quite, uh, uh, um, um, be globalized, as yeah. if, if you want me to use that word. Yeah, yeah or so culturally so adapted. Sure, right. sure, exactly, exactly. So the, we, 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 uh, I mean, re we, 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 we recognize the importance of China and um, uh, what it stands for in the geopolitical system of the world. Yeah, and you wanted to say uh, Yeah, I on. wanted to say, that uh, uh, the whole institute, the Technion as an institute is globalizing. And I don't know if any of you heard about uh, two global ventures. One is the Cornell Technion new campus in New York City, which focuses on uh, engineering, but applied engineering in order to reduce the gap between, univer between uh, academic and business. Namely, all the startup companies are going to come out of this uh, new venture. And recently, last month, we had um, uh, we launched another uh, venture with China, and uh, it's going to be a new institute in Shantou, Technion Shantou. This is in South China, and uh, and so so becoming global is part of our whole institute, not only the MBA program. Did you want to jump in? Well, I, I guess that I, I think one of the implications is that um, the structure of the curriculum uh, needs to be a bit more flexible to allow people to uh, take courses from the larger university. Uh, in our case, the larger university is the same institution as we're part of. Um, so I think uh, making it uh, culturally appropriate within the program to want to take a and uh, a straight academic course in a subject uh, that will give you the overview, will give you the, under the theories uh, in a field of um, institutions in another country or global policy making, and uh, I think that's important. And that, that's, that's one of the themes I think that um, I've heard from Ted. Lourdes wanted to jump in here with the different Yes, uh, I think uh, it's very important, uh, of course, if they can learn the language uh, but also, I think the cultures of the different parts of the world. China is very important, but I think we, we also have to see the world as, as, as a big set of countries. Just look at, at the map and, yes. and be able to recognize the regions because eventually these companies, they will be working, even in their countries, they will have to deal with different parts of the world. South America, the US, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, and so on. So I think I, I like to think about cross-cultural intelligence, that yes. we provide them with the capacity to understand not only the culture, but the implications of that culture, and also the implications of the different type of political systems or political policy, of the different interactions and the, and the kind of, of protocols that are very keen to the different countries. And I, I think that, that I want to add the second thing, technology. Technology helps us so much today, not as, uh, as a means, in order to be able to achieve this, uh, this way mm. of, like in this network, we can have courses online, we have ca can have teams of students doing projects online, a, a student from China, from India, from Ghana, and, and so on. So uh, we are able, we are living in a, such a great moment where we really can make this true. I think a few years ago we couldn't do that. So. I think that, that that's a very important part of the network and yeah. of course of the goal of yeah, our Yeah, if state. I could pick up on the, on the great moment theme here. What, what, what I find interesting, you go, you know, Coach is interested in China, 
Ghana is interested in China, Technion's interested in China, everybody's interested in China. And that's, that's obvious, we're interested in China. And you add up all these bilaterals and you think, oh, we're not, the, the network isn't intended to replace that, but the network will certainly supplement that in a very useful way. So that when, you know, we have a, a, a relationship with Ghana and Yale happens to have a new initiative on Africa, that's great. But the power of a network is not in all the bilaterals one at a time, but in the aggregation of all of these, these relationships. And that complements what you just said about the importance of cross-cultural ability. I don't know what we want to name that, but that is clearly this additional competence that we're all trying to develop. We don't actually teach business, I think, in the way that we taught it 20 years ago, going back, Margaret, to your original question. There's something new that we're all trying to achieve, which is, the, yeah, our students need to learn the, many of the things that they used to need to do, but they also need something new. And you call it cross-cultural awareness, but it, it's certainly that ability to connect and listen and rigorously, I emphasize that word, understand differences and commonalities. And also operate outside your comfort zone. There's a new book out called Global Dexterity that talks about that. But first, let me turn to Jerry because before we let go of this model of this idea of or question about what model of an economy are you teaching your students to operate in? I'm talking about basic things like rule of law, regulation, uh, privacy rights, things that are very different in Russia, in China, in, in different parts of the world. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, first of all, in terms of the uh, learning and teaching materials, I would say 80%, 90% of our textbooks are from the West. So we teach about the same thing. But nevertheless, the institutional forces, cultural, social, political uh, factors are very strong. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, for example, in the industry of e-commerce, in, uh, in every sector, subsectors sectors of e-commerce, the Western companies, the American companies are just not able to compete with the local ones. For example, mm -hmm. eBay or Amazon, they're just not able to compete with the local players because of institutional, political, cultural factors. Give us an example of just take the Amazon or eBay model. What do you mean? Uh, consumers have a very different uh, consumption behaviors and patterns, mm -hmm. preference, and so forth. The, uh, for example, eBay. Uh, in China, lots of shops are uh, being set up on, on, the, on the shops. Uh, lots of people, they like to bargain, they like to oh. have a c connection with the buyer and seller, and so forth. Uh, it's very different culture. So to us, in management education, we need to uh, educate our students to be aware of the cultural differences, also offer courses such as how to do business for, for other partners. And uh, uh, for everyone, it's nice to hear everyone is interested in understanding the way to do business in China. And uh, for the Chinese, it's equally important. And uh, the company, uh, the, the economy has a size. It's going to be, uh, it's already the number two economy. And, uh, but nevertheless, for the long, for relatively a long period of time, it's still going to be a hungry economy. It's going to be a catch up, a learning economy. Uh, the GDP per capita is about only 6,000 US dollars. So there is still great need for our students to learn from outside, from different cultures, the US and Europe and, and, and the rest of the world. So we have a very strong need to equip our students with uh, awareness of the uh, mm -hmm. diversity and different cultures and so forth. And Tirupati, what about you for the, the students? Uh, you never told us what percentage of your students are from India versus other parts of uh, Asia. No, or no, yes, you did, 95% India. India. Yeah, mostly, yeah. But they all, ho they all hope to have global ambitions. That was it. So the majority of them have, but actually probably still less. Uh, only 20 to 25% end up going outside the country and the remaining mm -hmm. 75 work within. Uh, <coughs> but I just want to add to something that Ted mentioned in terms of 
uh, this uh, GNAM, how it is helping us, because it's actually making this multilateral education possible, whether through the network courses or the network weeks, uh, that brings people from several countries together. So it gives the opportunity for uh, our students to form teams with the, uh, and then learn from that. Uh, I would also like to add the other thing which are doing about preparing them for the Indian uh, context as well. Uh, this is something which is done outside the class. Uh, as I mentioned, I think there is a lot of contrast and we need to understand the context very well. So <coughs> we provide opportunities for students. They work outside the class through their own groups. Um, target, for example, they conduct three or four events uh, every year. They target uh, deprived uh, groups and try to do something for them actually in terms of not just giving the money or so, but they organize the event. For example, about two months ago, um, in collaboration with uh, a, a hospital group called Jaipur Food, they make these artificial limbs at a very cheap rate, maybe mm -hmm. one-tenth of what is available outside uh, uh, in this part of the world. And we bring in poor people who can't afford it and make it uh, kind of give it to them free. Uh, and I think uh, the previous time they picked up uh, s deprived school children and then spent about uh, going, spending weekends with them and teaching them things of that sort and so on. This we believe will help them to kind of understand the people and also develop compassion, which is probably needed uh, down the line to operate in this world. Uh, so, <coughs> so I think these are some of the things we are doing on to develop these skills. This is just the beginning, but down the line, we expect a few results. So how are you all going about picking on up, up on what Laura just said and what Ted said? I mean, your students are only with you, what, two years? They've got a lot of courses to take just to learn the basics of organization and management and business and pricing and markets. How do you actually build in teaching this kind of social competence this ability or global dexterity or social dexterity, the ability to operate outside your own culture. I mean, how do you actually do it? Santiago. Well, over the past years, uh, what we have done at IE, for example, is introducing modules in the humanities or brought from the social sciences in the belief that uh, managers uh, shouldn't be accomplished uh, technicians or uh, financial engineers but rather uh, people who lead uh, other people and have these cross-cultural uh, skills that we were mentioning before. So it's, it's very use useful to go back to history, to, to the arts and architecture, and try to instill in managers those skills that are taught to architects. I mean, uh, perception, observation, learn from history is not a uh, I mean, Bernanke was uh, a, a, an economic historian, no? Yes. And he was able to go with the crisis because he knew a lot of, about the, the former crisis. So learning from history, from sociology, from many other social uh, uh, disciplines is actually a source of uh, lots of things for, 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 for management, no? So this is a way that I would suggest, uh, including also design thinking and many other disciplines that may enhance and widen uh, the mindset of, of managers. Who else would like to weigh in here? I'll take mm -hmm. the Michael and then Marianne, please. Well, I think we're doing something similar uh, to that in that um, one of the things that is absolutely critical for people to be able to do this is to be able to dialogue with each other, right? Um, exchange views, challenge each other's opinions, uh, not just about how the world works, but about what ought to be done. And it, it, it turns out there are some skills that are involved in that, which once developed enables those dialogues to happen. And they're pretty basic skills or fundamental skills. They're actually pretty complex, but they're fundamental nonetheless. And that is to be able to take uh, a discussion of a topic, be clear what you're discussing, formulate an issue that needs to be resolved through thought, state what it is you think. That is a cultural skill, okay? Think on an issue. What do you think on the issue? State it directly and have people then uh, provide some justification for it. Okay? For people to do that, they have to recognize the fundamental character of that skill. And um, if you go, th if you're a Yale undergraduate, you know it because you go through. But 
most of the students that come to the LSE come from cultures where that is not uh, something you get out of your undergraduate education. But, but you, when your premise is that to succeed in the globalized world, that, that Western way of interacting is going to be the way? Uh, I'm, well, you can tell from my accent that I'm kind of from around here. I'm pretty, uh, pretty yes. much <laughs> ethnocentric about yes. this. As absolutely. Now, the content of the communication uh, will be uh, very different because you have to be able to understand what someone from a very different uh, experience is trying to say. But you need a way to communicate. And I think it's mm -hmm. pretty good technology to be really <laughs> clear about what is the issue under discussion, okay? What is being asserted about it? What are the reasons being given for it? And, um, but for people who are coming in who don't have that educational background, you actually have to say that is what we are doing. The first day I, uh, with my students, I actually introduced them to the concept of a reasonable statement. And we go around the room and I ask everybody to uh, take the paradigm of a reasonable statement, which is claimed because of reason based on evidence, and present that statement in their own language, in their own script. And it turns out everybody can do it. And I prove, without having to tell them, mm -hmm. that the idea of a reasonable statement is in everybody's culture, where they find difficulty is in explaining the concept of dialogue, because they don't have words for that uh, in their language. And in fact, one of the students I remember got up and said, um, you s uh, this business about reason and claim, we got that. This idea about dialogue, we don't do that in this culture, but that's why I came here. Where, where was the student from? Egypt. Egypt, <laughs> interesting, Miriam. Yeah, um, I actually teach cross-cultural management, and uh, we identified three major uh, global capitals for managers. One is acceptance of diversity is necessary. Uh, the second one is uh, cultural intelligence. And the third one is global identity, which is the sense of belongingness to this global community. And uh, we actually assess these three characteristics before they start the course and at the end. And what I do to make them experience it is that I contact colleagues of mine in uh, other countries who teach a similar course at about the same time, and we team our students into virtual, four-person virtual teams, and they work together on a project for four weeks. So they have to they not only listen to what I tell them about uh, cultural characteristics, but also experience working together. And this is why I also think that the Global Leadership Network is very, very important because um, we didn't talk about it here, but, but we have twice a year, we actually have um, a one-week program in uh, selected, uh, uh, selected schools, not all the schools together. But I think uh, the next one is, the first one was in October, the next one will be in March. And um, students from all the participating uh, schools, like about eight schools, uh, can choose to go to each one of the other schools. And we, in Israel, last time we got about uh, 35 students, uh, mostly from Yale, but not only from Yale, also from Mexico and from China. And, uh, we've, and in, each count, in each school, the focus of this week is on, on a different topic. So for us, the topic is um, innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, we use this uh, Startup Nation book as a source of uh, inspiration. Mm -hmm. And we focus on innovation and entrepreneurship in this one week. But our, some of our students go to other schools, and so they learn different new things that they don't learn with us. But so the, uh, I just wanted, let me just get here from, uh, from I was so focused on the right-hand side, Jerry and, and, and Tira. Um, so take what Michael had to say about what's so essential, you know, that all students, global, globally interested business managers of, of, of any hemisphere need to learn. I mean, there are ways in which that is not the culture in much of Asia. So how do you, I mean, are you teaching your students how to operate in China, what words would you say to Western schools trying to teach how to operate in China or India? That they, that they you know, it's not always that the Chinese student's gonna wanna operate in the Western world, but also vice versa. Uh, 
traditionally in my part of the world, uh, education uh, for large part is about the knowledge dissemination. Yeah. But nowadays, we also emphasize uh, strongly the soft skills, critical thinking, and so forth. And um, a, uh, the network um, offers something a, I would consider an economic access to global uh, knowledge. And for example, the network courses, and uh, compared to the traditional mode of international exchange, we send out about 150 students overseas for exchange and receiving about equal number of students. But nevertheless, that's a small portion of students. For, for part-time students, they're not able to benefit from the regular exchange. And the network courses offered uh, through online means uh, makes the uh, learning uh, in different cultures feasible for lots of students. And we will consider adding our network courses and we're we are going to contribute our cases to the network so that but students- how do you teach your students to actually interact if they, I mean, do you role play? Uh, I was talking to Sharon Oster last night, I don't know if she's here today, but who had been the acting dean of SOM. Do you hear Sharon? Yes, yes, there you are. We had a great conversation at dinner and you said how some of your Asian students came to you and said, you know, we, we get the coursework, but but this this idea of small talk and this idea of, you know, going and, to a cocktail party. I don't know if you served wine when you did the role play, but you set up so that the American students or the Western students and the Asian students had a little session together and then critiqued one another. And then after a while, the, you said the American students said, well, you know, we don't, like, we don't know how to really deal with, what if we were going to Asia? And so the, the Asian students <laughs> said, you know, you're, you're too much in my space. Or you're, you know, they did a role play and then critiquing. I mean, how do you actually get down to that granular level so that your students would feel comfortable going out the first time they had to go to Indonesia or to, you know, Malaysia or, or in your case to, you know, over to India. I mean, do, do you try to do that sort of thing or do you just hope that they will pick that up kind of by osmosis? Uh, no, I think we do try. I think as, uh, there are two parts to the question you have asked. One is in terms of, uh, telling about how it operates in India. So for us, that has become part of our business model. We do have uh, courses, one week courses, two week courses, uh, which we offer to people from outside. And uh, we make a little bit of money on the side as part <laughs> of that. So I think that is, and that has become very popular, I should say, in the last uh, five, six years. Uh, <coughs> both uh, uh, the executive training people as well as uh, full-time students from the uh, schools in US and Europe, I think they do come regularly for that. Uh, as far as our students are concerned, I think the <coughs> institutes of management, the IIMs, uh, we are a little bit different from the rest of it because good part of our faculty have spent substantial amount of time in the Western world, in, uh, in the US, for example, I think, Half of our faculty uh, have PhDs and have worked in the US, uh, either in the US or UK and the rest of Europe. So many of us are familiar <coughs> and we don't have the problem of not being able to dialogue, which uh, Michael mentioned. I think we argue too much, I think, in some <laughs> ways. Uh, so uh, having said that, we also have a mechanism in the, by which we bring uh, uh, faculty from outside into uh, teaching courses. And also today we have a very targeted uh, mission to provide this international exposure of significant students to almost all our students. Uh, we are not yet there. We, I think, uh, provide that about 60% of our students today so that they pick up on these things as well. Does anyone else want to weigh in on this? Yeah, or I'll I'll oh, yes, please, do Anita. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Ted. <laughs> Okay, uh, I mean, uh, with the uh, multilateral uh, networking, uh, you actually create natural uh, groups together. Because when people uh, come for networking weeks or when other, uh, when, uh, in other programs, we have even more uh, longer periods, uh, for example, one semester. There, the students coming from different uh, countries uh, build groups together, and those groups uh, are uh, challenged mm -hmm. to uh, solve 
business projects, and those business projects, as Jerry was saying, are real-life business projects, uh, consultancy-like projects, and doing that uh, during a whole semester, uh, the students uh, within those groups go to those companies, and they actually uh, get a real-life project and solve that project throughout the semester with the help of the professor. And then in the end, they present that uh, paper or that presentation to the company. And in their natural uh, environment, they learn how to uh, talk to each other, uh, how to discuss things, how to uh, analytically uh, solve uh, complex problems. Uh, which is the case when they graduate and start working. And I find that natural environment very useful mm -hmm. for them, uh, basically uh, discussing things together with their peers. Uh, and th this is the best way to teach uh, and for mm -hmm. them to learn how to uh, approach each other. Mm -hmm. Ted. So I, I I think Margaret, you asked the key question, you know, how, or one of the key questions. Certainly, how do we how do we deal with this competence? How, how do we address it? And, and one of my faculty colleagues said, "Well, you can't teach one of the words in the title of the conference: complexity. You don't teach complexity. So, what do we do? And I, and in some ways, I'll try to make the problem sound even more dramatic. We have all these business schools in the world, and we're all really small." So, and each school is trying to get a little slice of top talent at the top of their, their market. Uh, but it's actually, I think, really encouraging to hear from my colleagues and to understand that the students whom we bring in are helping us solve this problem. Now, we have different students, and in some ways, you know, IE is so enviable with 95% international to begin with, but they're helping enormously. But the, I think the core idea of the network and, uh, is to say each of us has our top slice of students and faculty, and we're figuring out ways to learn from each other, and, and there is no easy solution to this problem. So in the background, uh, you know, there, there's a sense of let's have a lot of different experiments go on throughout the network and learn because this is not an easy problem. And then also with the network, let's put our students and faculty in a position where they experience this. And then they're going to get better and better and better. And, and I think that is... That's what, to me, is so exciting about this process. So uh, I don't, you know, in some ways I would say the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> the second answer is I'm really hopeful. I want to go to audience questions very soon. I just want to throw out one other question to the panel, and just whoever really wants to weigh in on this. It's something Lourdes mentioned right at the beginning. Tell us, in your, your student body, I mean, what are they looking for? This has been a theme that, that's been discussed today and some of the panels and to what degree are they interested in also tackling some of the big societal issues that you know whether it's climate change whether it's uh, water shortage um, whether it's the threat of pandemics whether it's the gap between the elites and everyone else that one that they may be concerned with, or two, that as businesses ultimately can turn around and bite you wherever you're operating in the world. Is there a demand for your from your students for this kind of um, learning these kinds of skills where they're going to have to work also across sectors? They're going to have to work with NGOs. They're probably going to have to try to affect government policy when wherever they're operating. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah well, Lord, go ahead. Yeah. Answer. <clears throat> I think that, that uh, there are uh, students who are coming from companies who are dealing already with, because uh, most of our students are part-time, you know, mm -hmm. so they work and they, they are studying their, their MBA or other master programs. So they are already dealing with some of those issues in their own environment. So they, they are very interested in them, but even those who might not be so interested, it is part of our mission to make sure that they become interested in them and they understand them. 
and they see the, the, the importance and the, the how, how relevant they will be in the future if they are not re yet in, in my company. So we, uh, I think some of the examples that have been given about projects, about uh, uh, different uh, experiential learning, we use them in order to, to provide these type of projects or cases. Uh, every student at the end of the program has to do a project so like, like Mira was explaining. And we always try to do in a transversal way, introduce a sustainability issue, mm -hmm. both socially and environmentally, and introduce ethics issues that might be present in, the, in those projects. And as well as study cases that are not only on the issues, but also always with the international component. And that's where we, we stress, for example, in a course that some will, will focus on one country project and the others in another country project. Michael, you wanted to jump in on this. Well, I think that um, what Ted, uh, Ted is very understated, and he has understated the importance of the network. And I think it's an. Uh, I think we'll gradually see this. We actually, I, I chide you, by saying it's it's more about advanced management than it is about global. Uh, but I think you know schools of uh, universities are very conservative uh, institutions, right? Uh, there are a lot of creative talents to manage, and they don't have a common product. Uh, they don't see themselves as having a common product. So the world's changing faster than we would ever change, um, and yet. Uh, surprisingly, we don't set aside a lot of resources uh, for innovation. We d people do it in their research, but getting the research into the classroom is yet another problem. And so, um, you know, you might think of ourselves as having 3% of our revenue available uh, to really innovate for educational purposes mm -hmm. at most, right? And the world's changing faster than that, so to speak. And what the network allows us to do is uh, kind of pool the very small resources each of us has in innovation so that uh, we actually do change at a rate commensurate with the demands on these institutions. I don't think we've quite figured out how to do that yet, but um, with the, uh, there are a couple of initiatives that I think will be role models, initiatives here that will be role models for that. Hope that's Thank you for chiding me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, I want yes. to add to something to the question you raised uh, in terms of working in the social sector and other things. Uh, we don't consider ourselves as a typical business school, but uh, we are school of management, that's mm -hmm. what we say. Because we have a center for uh, public policy and public management, and also there is a center for governance and ethics. And these centers do focus on many of these uh, projects of interest to public health and so on and so forth. And so our students do get opportunities to work on some of those projects while they are there. And the institute itself has taken a decision to encourage that in the sense if our students end up going and working there for say up to three years or more, uh, then we give them the education fee. We refund their tuition, mm -hmm. all their expenses together, so they don't need to sacrifice. They get the free education. So that's what we say. Okay. Uh, we have a business ethics course in each of our program. Uh, the feedback we got from the students are, uh, first of all, they think the subject is important, but they don't like the materials just in abstract. They like in-depth discussion, real-world application, real cases. And they would like to see uh, discussions on business ethics, sustainable development, more relevant to their work and more relevant uh, uh, in, the, in the context. Interesting. Um, we can, oh, yes, and meanwhile, think about the questions you want to ask, and if you raise your hand, mics will come your way. Yes, at, 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 at the end of every semester, we, we do evaluate uh, our lecturers, and that is done by the students. And if you look at the comments raised by some of the students, uh, you, you, you see that they appreciate the importance of education, which is to make sure that there should be a change in their lives, there should be a change in our communities, there should be a change in the world. And in some cases, they do raise questions about the quality of teaching, that we came here and we, we were ex expecting one, two, three, four topics to be introduced in the, what, this one, two, three, four courses. So um, um, students are expecting some change. Um, they want to see that after graduation, they can bring some impact into whatever they do at the workplace and which, which, which um, they do express when it comes to evaluating the students. Were they so saying they were disappointed that you weren't giving them what they wanted in this area? I, I, I mean, in some cases, 
students would raise questions about particular lecturers and the particular courses that they would prefer or they would recommend. There is always a column for students to make some recommendations and they would do recommend that we would wish that this particular course could introduce oh, yeah. one, two, three, four because it is more relevant to what we are doing than then perhaps. Sure. Uh, questions from the audience, right here, the center, about four rows up. And um, if you would just uh, state your name and uh, uh, sort of affiliation, whether you're a student or a whatever. Uh, my name is Frederick Frank. I'm a graduate of Yale University. Um, I'm on the board of advisors of SOM. And so I've had a long association with the Yale and my son is here as a sophomore at the moment. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the panelists on coming long distances to share with us their thoughts and uh, congratulate them on their English. And I would very much like to congratulate Ted for his vision of creating the global but Don't network. congratulate me for my English. <laughs> <laughs> I feel Your like English is questionable, but that's another <laughs> subject. And my question is, given the importance of globalization, and hence languages, which we call foreign languages here, um, in your schools, do your, are your students required to take a, quote, foreign language, be it Chinese or Spanish or English? Is there a requirement in your school to take a foreign language during the two years that they're in school? Who'd like to address that? Kwame said already that it was. Yes, do, Anita. Uh, I mean, uh, in Istanbul, in Turkey, uh, our university teaches uh, all courses in English. So uh, all our students have uh, to have English uh, as their uh, first but second language to the uh, mother tongue. In some of our programs, uh, our students are obliged to take uh, an additional uh, language, not always Chinese, sometimes they prefer to take uh, German or Spanish or Italian uh, since we do uh, quite a business with Europe. So uh, it's um, in many cases it's not an obligation, but if they take it, it they can uh, have it as an elective. Uh, only in our Master of Science in International Management programs, uh, within uh, a global alliance program, uh, they, it's a must to speak a third language uh, to a minimum, more than intermediate level. Anyone yeah. else like to weigh in on this? You, you, you already said that. Uh, initially, I, I don't know whether you were here. Uh, for the undergraduate students, we will have to take either Chinese or Spanish as mm -hmm. a four before you move to level 200. For the master's program, you don't learn any other language, but English is the medium of instruction uh, at the University of Ghana. And Jerry, what about in China, uh, considering that China is doing business all over the world, particularly heavily in Latin America and in Africa? Uh, everyone uh, in our school has to pass an English language examination, written and oral, to be admitted into any of our programs. And uh, we do have two programs taught in English, an undergrad and the international MBA. Uh, but English is uh, about the only foreign language we teach in the programs. At undergrad level, MBA level, uh, English is also a required subject. So you're going to assume that if your students go to, Bra well, Brazil's not a good example because they're yet another language, but somewhere else in Latin America that English will be the common language? That's an abs assumption, yeah. Um, we have a question from Egade. Uh, and so I think we're going to hear it. Are we going to see the questioner also in the monitor? Digital graduate students. What knowledge, skills, and attitudes should be taught at business schools to assure that native digital students have the competence to start up a technology-based company or digital enterprise? So, if, I, I'm sorry, so you're saying what, what non, and you were talking about non-digital students or, di 
Uh, no, I talking about technology. Not native digital professors. I'm not, can you help translate? I don't quite understand. This sounds Digital native professors. Digital? Uh, Non-digital. Non so what is your, your question is this? Uh, do you understand the question? Ask in Spanish. Okay. ¿Me puedes dar la pregunta en español, por favor? Sí, que la, nuestras escuelas de negocios tienen profesores que son que no son nativos digitales propiamente. Entonces, los estudiantes sí lo son. ¿Cuáles son los conocimientos o las competencias que se deben de desarrollar en las escuelas de negocios para asegurar eh, que los estudiantes tengan las competencias tecnológicas y llegar a ser emprendedores digitales al emprendimiento? So, she's asking if, uh some of the professors in the business schools not necessarily are uh, native digitals, like the millennials, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> like oh, them. I have to plead guilty. <laughs> so, uh, so how, you know, what are the skills that they need, the students, to get? And I think uh, what she's saying is that what are also the, the new ways of of teaching them or the mm -hmm. skills that us as professors will have to have in order to be <laughs> able to, uh, to teach them in a way uh, to, uh, to become uh, digital uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, I guess, tell me if you, I'm right, you are interested in, 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 an, in some entrepreneurship that has to do with the g digital world and therefore you would like to be able to, to get those skills in the school. Mm -hmm. I, is that? Uh, to, to what degree is that component part of, uh, are you assuming your students are already way more digitally literate than most of the professors, or do you have specific courses to help them? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I guess that's the answer, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like Santiago. Actually, what is your name, if I may ask? <laughs> ¿Cómo te llamas? F Fernanda. Fernanda. <laughs> what I suggest is that you come here to Yale. <laughs> I'm, I, <laughs> and visit the classrooms because they are state of the art in terms of technologies. And what I'm sure is that the faculty here use all these uh, resources, you know, technological resources in order to enhance the learning experience, no? But I, I think you are actually pointing at a very important thing, which is uh, how we can actually uh, help the faculty use all the resources that are now available in terms of I mean, all, all, all the things that are present here at Yale, I insist, because I, I was very much impressed no, at uh, the quality of the classrooms here. So you are pointing at something which is uh, important. I guess that many of our professors are actually becoming more and more uh, eager and, uh, you know, easy with uh, the technologies. In, at my school, we were uh, very lucky because uh, 13 years ago, we started blended programs, so most of our faculty members are able to teach online, and they do this in a very natural way. I know that that's the case at Degade as well, mm -hmm. and at Getulio Vargas, which is uh, present uh, somewhere in the audience. But anyway, uh, we are learning here at the network, actually, and uh, tomorrow you're running a seminar with a blended format using uh, technology in a very intense way. So what I hope is that uh, the network can actually provide you with answers in terms of uh, giving opportunities for your uh, setup or for your future company with a digi digital base, no? But there's also the whole question of, you know, the role of social media in marketing in, in, in all the traditional aspects of business. And are the professors, do they know enough about the potential there to actually help the students or are the students essentially leading that? Michael, do you have a thought on that, or Miriam? Well, I'll leave this up to our marketing uh, professors, actually. <laughs> oh, uh, no, you're a management professor. You should. Yeah, um, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in, my, in our case, most of our students are in, from engineering and sciences, so they are very well equipped with the knowledge about uh, technology. Their bachelor degree is in, in engineering. And not all the professors in management graduated the engineering school. So 
but there is nothing that can replace person-to-person, face-to-face interaction. So to answer your question, it is important to learn about the digital, uh, how to use um, the technology, but there is nothing that can replace person-to-person interaction. And even, even here, I think it's important that we have this opportunity mm-hmm. uh, to get together. So not all the professors need to, do, need to know e-commerce and so forth, but, the, but this should be part of the program, of course. I also like to ask that uh, technology, we see it as a mean, you know, it's to attain something. And I, I, I'm sure that in many of these universities and schools, we are using the technology like in online courses for a long time or, or to do some work uh, with using like Blackboard platforms and other type that allows you and, and makes you use a lot of the technology. But I would say something, you are talking about business a business uh, on some digital, uh, related to digital. I think that the core of business, you know, it, be it in technology or being in, in some other kind of, of, of sector, you know, it's ba- it's the basics. The basics of, of growing a business doesn't necessarily mean that because it is, you have to learn what uh, Ted was saying about uh, uh, marketing and strategy and finance, all of that you, leave, you need to learn. Whether you learn it using technology or not, the fact is that all of those tools are going to help you to have a successful digital-related business. Another question from the audience here. Uh, Right back here. Uh, Gentleman there. Hi, uh, my name is Arthur Nacht. I have an MBA from a very long time ago at a different business school, but uh, an MFA here at the Yale School of Drama. Uh, class of 2006 in in theater in theater management Mm -hmm. Um, I think the question we've just been asked by the uh, young woman in Egata is excellent and let me just point out that it isn't just the expertise of your faculty with regard to hardware or software that I think made her question important but the way the World Wide Web and social media have energized the ability of businesses to look into the profiles and the interests and the demographics of the people who are at the other end of the computer is tremendous, such that a company can observe, uh, well, can serve up an ad, serve up an ad to you based on a, a search you've done on Google or whether or not you opened a particular email and what it was it about the subject line that appears to have captured your interest. And they can know that about you. Now that is a level of sophistication which goes far beyond mere hardware and software. And so with regard to her question, uh, I would think it's very challenging and difficult for faculty that is say 38 to plus years old that is a non-digital native to keep up with all of that. But I do believe she's pointing at the right challenge as we go forward in the rest of this century. Anyone like to comment on that? We agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Okay. No, I, I guess you're pointing you know, at a very important thing, but, but I know that uh, a good number of faculty members here present, for example, use social networks in a very act- acti- active way. For example, Twitter. How many of you who belong to the faculty here use uh, Twitter in order to communicate or to release or even in terms of the learning process? So I'm more confident, you know, in terms of how the faculty is moving towards all the possibilities of learning from the potential of social networks and uh, all the meanings of the new digital world. No? We have a question on the left I side. Can I just oh, say yes. one thing? Yeah. For example, uh, at our institution, because of this challenge, and we understand, and this is from all the schools, from undergraduate to graduate, last year we gave, I mean, we, the, the institution gave uh, all the faculty an iPad. You know, maybe that's very mm-hmm. basic, but not only gave the iPad, but also started to offer courses for faculty to learn different techniques, how to use the iPad to teach X or to teach Y, you know, so that they can, we can enrich our own uh, uh, 
set of, of techniques in order to be to the, to the level because we have found something that you need to catch the attention of the students. And instead of them going into Facebook or this or that, which is fine, but if you want to, to them to listen to you, you have to be doing something on their own language and attract them. So this is a policy, and I'm, I'm sure that in most of the schools, we're gonna have to do more of that. Um, yes, a few. And then I hope a student here will ask a question. Ah, okay. Uh, I, I'll just say that uh, this is not only an issue for the students, I would say it's also an issue for the organization. Uh, having uh, also uh, the executive education responsibility uh, at Koch Graduate School of Business, we are very much in contact with organizations and we, uh, we tailor-made programs for them. And there is a tremendous, uh, tremendous demand for uh, us to teach digital marketing, uh, social media marketing mm -hmm. for the organizations. And that comes uh, not only from uh, medium, small size companies, but also large uh, corporates uh, who do business in Turkey. So I believe uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a responsibility of us who is uh, over 35, 38 years old to learn digital, to be digital and uh, communicate. We have a question right here from a student. Hello, uh, my name is Hassan. I'm a second year MBA student here at the Yale School of Management. And um, while I think we, we hear great things about what the business school of tomorrow is looking like from the collective insight that you provided, what would be interesting is to think about what does the business school of day after tomorrow look like? And there are two uh, areas in which I'd like to hear your thoughts. One is we talked about, I think Barbara started with the internationalization of business schools. And secondly, the means and, and, and the medium of instruction. So on the first, I think there's only one school represented up here, which has truly become an tr international school. IE is not a Spanish business school, IE is a global business school. Whereas all of the schools represented here, including uh, my own alma mater, is very much focused on the ge geography in which it is based. Is IE representative of the future of business where the la medium of instruction is not the native language of the land, where the employment is not focused on the native country th in which it is based, and where the faculty itself is very international? Or is there still the value in this, uh, in this geocentric model of this education? And the second is the, is the medium, medium of education in which um, you know, there is no online program uh, at many of the schools that are represented here because it's seen as something that is below the prestige of the institutions that are represented here. Is that a sustainable model as we move forward into an age where many people will not want to give away two years of their lives um, and, and go to business mm -hmm. school? Uh, is part-time, uh, uh, we mentioned that Egede at Monterey at least has embraced the part-time program, whereas some of the schools don't truly believe in that model. Are those trends that will, will change the future of education is I guess the summary of the question. So uh, I'm tempted, so I'm gonna dive in. Dive in. So <laughs> at some, you know, I'm not gonna uh, answer the question fully, but I think that most students, most of your colleagues here still want to connect with top MBAs here at Yale. And they also want to connect with selected groups of top MBAs around the world. I don't think that the MOOC model, where you're connecting with just a superstar faculty member and tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of other people, most of whom you have no interest in, is going to be something that will replace the experience that you've had here. And I know a little bit about your wonderful experience and I wish you the very best. <laughs> <laughs> so, having said that, the model that you're talking about is a substantial threat given the way the industry's organized. That's a longer conversation. On the, um, maybe I'll just leave. Yeah. Because, you know, there. that's a great, very close to what I was going to ask as the final question. We have five minutes and nine seconds to go. So let's just hear from everyone. Miriam, next, just a thought about the business or management school of the future and, and, and the future of different kinds of technology-based learning, but 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, in our school, the, the spoken language is Hebrew, except for the MBA. 
the MBA, because we want to globalize, we, we switch to English. So I think there is going to be a common language to all MBA students wherever they are, because they need, they, th this is the network, they need to communicate with each other. And um, I think we are driven by changes in the, in the environment. So it's hard for me to predict how the business school is going to look like unless I know how the world is going to look like in the future. Michael. Well, I don't know if we'll have management schools um, in, um, in the period after next. I mean, we'll, I think we'll either, in terms of professional schools, either they'll all be management schools uh, or we won't have one, okay? Um, because, uh, you know, fundamentally all these different management, all these different professional schools are trying to do the same thing, and that's allow people to create things to respond to ill-structured and very threatening problems. And you see that in public policy schools. You see that in a way in design schools. I have a feeling that these are all, these, these different schools are gonna merge into one type. Um, and then each will find ways of representing the particular specialized um, kind of approaches to problem solving. But I have a feeling uh, we're gonna have a kind of convergence. And I think this school was uh, part of that idea to begin with, and I think it'll just accelerate. Um, yeah, I'm looking into the future where professors and lecturers are not going to upload for students to download. <laughs> <laughs> that was short and sweet. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm looking at, at uh, schools where innovation is in the air and they are creators and they are entrepreneurial and therefore but in a, in a global arena where they have these, they ed get out of the school and they are, have created something, maybe a new business uh, with colleagues from different mm -hmm. other parts of the world, not by themselves only. I think we are looking uh, at a more ongoing education and uh, definitely we will include uh, studying while working and uh, including, uh, let's not say online, but uh, virtual uh, education coming together, but then going apart and having things online. Uh, having a blended education, including all the uh, uh, bits and pieces that we hear today and making a whole of it and making it lasting and sustainable. Professor. Yeah, I think some of it is already here. It's not the day after tomorrow, particularly the part time and so on. I think they will take place and we'll use more and more of the digital technology. But uh, having heard from it, you can see that this is not going to substitute uh, still being small and being selective. And probably the first part of your question, we'll wait and see whether it happens. Uh, there's no question there will be increased globalization and technology use in education. However, I don't think our school will be ever as international as IE. Uh, China is a large country. I suspect at the most we may have 30% of our students international. On the technology use, uh, the prediction says since the 70s, computer aided education, computer aided education will replace classroom teaching. It has never occurred. I don't think it will ever. <laughs> Santiago. <laughs> well, how will uh, a business school look like on the surface of Mars uh, in maybe <laughs> in 30 years time? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that uh, we we expect lots of uh, you know inputs, for example, from psychology from the humanities, from neuroscience. So part of the knowledge will probably be delivered by installing you know, a sort of chip in your brain. <laughs> but probably what we have to work on is uh, on human development, mm -hmm. respect, diversity, uh, civilization. No? So what I hope is that the business school uh, on Mars is a much better business school in terms of uh, progress, no? human progress. <laughs> and on that note, I just think it's, it, this has been a marvelous panel. We've seen the richness and diversity and, and all of your students are so lucky to have both practical but visionary leaders here. And I want to thank all of you and thank our audience. And Ted's going to just have a couple final words.
Okay, I've learned how to uh, advance the podium up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that. So, uh, I first of all would like to just thank Margaret Warner. Uh, thank you very much. She's another person who makes it look so easy, but I, I know sort of why. <laughs> and then I, I would very much like to thank my colleagues uh, from the Global Network for Advanced Management. And, and as I mentioned, there are many of uh, my colleagues in the audience as well, and, and we're going to get together tomorrow and have yet another meeting and move this network forward. But at this point, there's another special treat. Uh, I wanted to take just a couple moments and recognize Bob Schiller. Uh, there he is, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> Bob, is the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. He was awarded the prize uh, this past fall along with uh, Lars Hansen and Jean Fama from the University of Chicago. Bob uh, is the recognized founder of the field of behavioral finance, excuse me, behavioral finance. Uh, he's been uh, such a big influence on Yale, and he's had a secondary appointment in the Yale School of Management. He's had a huge influence here. He's had a huge influence on the world. Um, I wanted to mention for everyone, you will have a chance to hear from Mr. Schiller, Professor Schiller, tomorrow. Uh, we have another finance panel at 11 a.m. So uh, it's a plenary session, so it'll be here in Zhang Auditorium finance and society, markets and behavior. He'll be joined by David Swenson, Ziwu Chen, Jane Mandillo, and my faculty colleague, Will Getzman. Wow. And next Thursday, for those of you who are in New Haven, Thursday, January 16th at 5 p.m., Bob will give a talk here, again, in Zhang Auditorium, speculative asset prices, and uh, we look forward to that. Um, we're going to now move to the atrium, where we're going to have a chance to mingle and celebrate and hopefully have a few casual bits of conversation with Professor Schiller, Nobel Prize winner. Thank you very much. Thank you.